Good afternoon and welcome to the Future of Finance, where today we will discuss open banking. I shall now pass you over to Dominic Hobson and our panel. Hello everybody and welcome to our webinar, hosted in conjunction with our partners at Trade and Invest Wales and Fintech Wales. Open banking is just the opening scene of a three-part drama of total economic transformation. I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance, and I'm delighted to moderate our discussion this afternoon. Open banking, which aims to improve outcomes for consumers and small businesses by forcing established banks to compete a lot harder to keep their customers' business, came into effect in the United Kingdom in January 2018. Its method is to give consumers and small businesses the option to share elements of their banking data with third party suppliers of products and services. Now, nearly four years on, the Open Banking Implementation Entity, which publishes, promotes, and supervises adoption of the API standards which drive open banking, reports that some 120 odd entities now have at least one proposition live with customers. Yet, public awareness of open banking remains extremely low, which matters not only for the obvious reason that competition drives innovation and productivity, but because as our title suggests, open banking is only the first step towards an open finance regime that embraces personal pensions, insurance and credit as well. And indeed leads eventually to an open data economy in which individual and corporate customers use their data to completely reshape, not just finance, but the entire economy as well. And to help us look at the current state of play in open for open finance and the long-term vision of a digital economy driven by open data. We're joined by four experts with direct experience of the field and the technical and commercial challenges that it presents. Harriet Rees is head of data science at Starling Bank, an organization which was designed from the outset to embrace open banking, its app giving customers the ability to browse a variety of third-party products and services. Julia McCall is Commercial Director at Chetwood Financial Limited, the bank that tailors its savings and lending products to the individual, right down to adjusting its rates as the credit scores of borrowers improves. Dr. Catherine Jones is Senior Lecturer in Diversity and Inclusion at the School of Computer Science and Informatics, which she joined in 2017, having spent most of her career as a commercial software engineer in the telecommunications industry. Sarah Williams Gardner is CEO of FinTech Wales, the membership association and champion of FinTech in Wales, which she joined after helping to found Starling Bank. Sarah also held a variety of roles at IBM. In addition to our panelists, we also of course have you, our audience, and all of us encourage everybody uh, watching or listening to submit questions and comments throughout this webinar by using the Q&A or chat functionality at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Rest assured, I won't be saving those questions up to the end, but I'll answer them, or I'll invite our panelists to answer them as we go along. So you can be an integral part of this discussion right from the outset. I'd like to begin uh, by asking our two bankers what their own strategy uh, is for open banking today and what impact it's had um, on their revenues and their costs. And perhaps I could um, throw this at you first, um, Julia, what is the strategy which uh, which Chetwood is pursuing for open banking, open finance, and the long term open data? Have you increased your budget allocation uh, to to this um, this opportunity? What impact has it had so far on your revenues, your costs? Have you introduced new services? Uh, have you been able to transform your your customer experiences? T tell us tell us what open banking, open finance has been like for you so far. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dominic. So I guess at Chetwood, you know, we have a really clear purpose around making customers better off through the use of technology. Um, and it sounds a little bit like Harriet, you know, from the outset, we wanted to make sure that the business we were building was set up not only to use open banking, open finance, but actually to consume lots of different data sources. Um, you know, we recognize that customers of the future will want to be able to control and, and choose how they use their data. Um, and also to be able to select a, a much broader use of, of partners, if you like, um, as opposed to kind of this traditional sense of, of kind of using that high street bank for, for all of your product needs. Um, and so our business really from the outset was focused around creating a, you know, an API based model that would allow us to use that data to, to deliver a better customer experience, absolutely, but also to help those customers who 
perhaps struggle to get verification, whether it's in terms of bank account details, whether that's in terms of income, um, all of these, all of these areas are key and, and you know, open banking can provide massive opportunities there in terms of uh, really helping those customers not only access credit, uh, but also get access to cheaper and fairer credit. Um, so that's, that's pretty central really to kind of how we set the business up um, and, and what we're trying to do. And has it helped you understand those customers better? Are you able to access more and more data to improve your understanding of a individual customer? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things our model is very focused on is this partnership model. So we, you know, we work with partners like Money Supermarket, ClearScore, Totally Money and others. And we effectively recognize that customers want to be able to go to those marketplaces and that they can help provide them with that element of choice and um, and really help them to, to get a broader access um, to credit products generally. And so we use data not only through open banking, but also from partners like those um, to actually enable those decisions and, and ultimately to make better credit decisions and, and broaden the opportunity. You know, almost a third of customers that use sites like that get no offers for products, for credit products. Um, so there's a massively underserved population um, and that's that's who we're trying to focus our efforts on and um, clearly one of the things we've seen with open banking in its early stages is that it has tended to be adopted more by those prime users so people who typically have better access to credit and cheaper credit um, our business model is actually about helping those that are less well served by the market um, and so we see this and other data sources as a, as a yeah, really a really key way to do that thank you julia could i through and you mentioned partnerships i'd like to come back to those in a minute but harriet could you give us as i said at the outset um you know starling's been committed to to open banking open finance right from the outset uh so you have um several years experience of this now what has been the impact uh of of your strategic decision on revenues costs customer experience sure thanks dominic you're right this has been you know, Starling's intention since the beginning. You know, we, we want to allow customers to have access to all of the data that they might need or want access to in the Starling app, even if it be from other providers, and to use that for a purpose. Um, Starling's been on board with this, you know, right from right from the offset, I would say we were even ahead of the pack in many cases. Um, and I think that's perhaps where some of our frustration lies, in that we've been really, really right up there in terms of get it, getting our APIs ready, offering the services that, that everyone else should be offering. But we just think that customers being able to see their data in the app isn't enough. We need to get to the next thing now, using that data. And some of the things that Julia mentioned there, you know, actually using it to make people's financial lives better. That's the bit that we want to move on to. And I think that will actually really help Julia with, with some of the things you were just talking about. The people who know about open banking are often the people that are already very, very well informed. They already know that they've made a good financial choice in going to this provider or another. The people who don't know about open banking are sometimes the ones that really need to know about it and need to know that, that this stuff is there to make their financial lives better. And we just need to get on with that bit now. And that's, I think, where our frustration has been um, with, with open banking in, say, the last 12, 18 months. Mm -hmm. Dominic, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to concur with Harriet. I mean, mm -hmm. Starling bought open, open banking APIs out before open banking APIs were being talked about because they wanted to do the right thing by the consumers. And we're hearing that from, from Chetwood. And I think what you've got here in fintechs is wanting to do the right thing for consumers. You know, we're, we're hearing wanting to serve the underserved, wanting to give better deals to people. Um, and so I suppose there is some frustration with open banking. Has it delivered everything that it promised it was going to deliver? Most probably not yet. And we're bringing quite a few people on that journey, which we can completely understand. Um, you know, it is a bit like the smartphone coming out. We haven't got all of the apps that are all connected yet. Um, and open banking isn't something that consumers need to know about. You know, through the partnerships that Chetwood are talking about, um, which, which, to be fair, are possibly slightly um, different partnerships to the actual sort of um, real data because they're showing the consumers what products are out there. Um, but, you know, in order to bring to the consumer a really rich 
valuable, fair access to finance. Um, you know, I'm hearing frustrations not just from people on this call, but but across the FinTech Wales um, membership to, to make it broader, fairer, more inclusive. We have to be a little bit faster. And, um, you know, the CMA9 and, and the, the, um, the Open Banking Institute, I know they're doing all the right things and, and they're trying, but we're sort of, we're, we're bringing... Um, we're bringing super tankers in, into, into, a, into a Mediterranean where we've got speedboats already off and running and, and we've got to find a way of doing it possibly a little bit faster. Well, I'm, 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 I've noted frustration, but before we, we, we're going to have, a, we're going to talk about that quite a lot, I think. But just before we do, um, uh, I'd like to ask Julia about the, these partnerships, because one of the ways in which these benefits are exposed to consumers is through partnerships you're just one organization starling is just another organization but you somehow have to get the ideas and the products and the capabilities in front of people so how do those how effective are those partnerships and and how well are they working compared to how you would like them to work yeah okay great question i mean i think the key for me really when it when you boil it down is it is it, it comes down to consumer trust and for me, in many cases, and I know ClearScore have done some research on this recently that, that backs it up, that our own primary research has actually said the same thing too, which is there are, those organizations already have a, a trust relationship with that customer base. So, you know, they're logging on to ClearScore on a regular basis. They're looking at their credit score. They're using the educational materials. They are already uh, a fan of and an, endorsing that brand. Same is true for something like Money Supermarket. You know, many of our customers who come through those channels are very emotive about the fact that Martin Lewis himself has recommended the products that they've taken. You know, that is how strongly they feel about that experience. And so those platforms have actually a really amazing opportunity and one which many of them are embracing to, to really position themselves as the partner of choice for open banking and to then enable customers to be able to see access to greater products through a number of fintechs who, like ourselves, would be effectively partnered with them and integrated with them in terms of that data share. Um, and, you know, from a selfish perspective, we could try and get customers to come directly to Chetwood to do that. Our, our view actually is that that marketplace model gives consumers more choice. And so ultimately, that feels like a better, a better place for customers, a better outcome for customers, ultimately. Um, so I think it's really important. And I think that they're doing a lot now around that communication, as we've all said, those less well-informed customers who don't understand it, actually maybe some of these partners have a better opportunity to really land those messages and engage with those customers in a way that is more meaningful, ultimately. Thanks, Julia. Catherine? Yeah, can I add something to that? It's just a little bit of sort of antidotal evidence, really. But I was chatting to some students about this. And my students, very technical students, they understand data governance, they understand security, they've built APIs, they've built front end, back ends. They, they've got lot, quite a bit of experience in software now over the last few years. And yet when I talked to them about open banking, they were like, oh, I don't like the idea of that. I don't like the idea that my data, my banking data is now going to be used by third parties. And I'm like, well, you're in control of it. You'll, you'll give permission. But they very much felt like that was an obstacle to them, but they're technical. So how do you get to the users who aren't technical and convince them that data that was once looked after by the incumbent banks, which had a physical presence, is just as well looked after by third party um, startups uh, using that data and in the sense, trying to give them a nice vision on that data and hopefully some actions that can take place. But yeah, I think there's something around how do you convince people of the trust, you know? Have you had yeah, the conversation I... with them about, about it, it, it's their consent, they have to consent to use this data, but there's a long-term vision here, isn't there? That the, the consumer owns their own data and then they decide who gets to see it, which parts of it they get to see. If you think about that radically, it is, as I said in my opening remarks, it kind of turns the whole of capitalism on its head, in fact. It puts the consumer in charge rather than suppliers continually merchandising products to people. Consumers actually say, well, I think I might like to buy an insurance policy and I'm going to show what data I need to show to find that insurance policy. And then the machine, if you like, goes and searches for all that in a much more sophisticated, much more aggressive way than it does today. Do, do, are they impressed, your, your young students, are they impressed by that? But I think there's an assumption there that people actually want to manage their own data and want the control of what to do with it. So if you don't fully understand what that means or where that goes afterwards, then it's, it can be worrying. 
if the banks look after it for you, then maybe that was the seat. And I think that can be a bit of a blocker. But um, I totally agree. Yeah, I, but, but, I totally agree. It's, it's a change. so true. But we're in a change. We're in we're in a state of change now, and it will take a while. Um, you know, you can't make change overnight. It's going in the direction. But I, I think I just, think, just coming on. back onto Julia's point, you know, the, these um, these marketplace platforms, um, we we know on on this call that you cannot pay Martin Lewis to advertise your product, and 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 he makes that very clear. And because you can't pay him, people do trust him that he has done some some good due diligence, um, and and has the the consumer's best interests at heart from that. So that the trust in all of this is is absolutely um, absolutely paramount, such that, you know, when you talk about um, technical students, um, to Catherine's point, that are a bit worried about where their data would go, I think what we're talking about here is more the, con the general consumer that will go through those platforms and possibly might have less worry um, until their trust is broken. Um, so, you know, when we talk about Chetwood and Starling, two, two great brands that we have here, you know, it's absolutely paramount for them to maintain that trust and for them to make it easy for us, the consumers. Now, you know, I put it out there. I was associated with Starling, so I'm slightly biased um, and I am a customer of Starling. But I love the fact that they remind me on a regular basis to give my confirmation and re-consent to my bank being connected to my accounting software. That doesn't happen if you have a big uh, you know one of the traditional bank accounts um, so they respect it and they make it easy and therefore it is much more trusted um I'm, I'm sure i read that that 90 day consent is changing soon which will make it a lot easier so instead of the um the, the user having to give that consent every time they use a particular app that's going to be by the, the intermediary uh, applied and i can't remember the name of the other company but that'll be brilliant so changes like that i think to the apis are really useful I'm sure that yeah. the, the, the invisibility of what's going on is going to be very important to adoption. Uh, we're starting to get here into, into, I've heard, frustration, lack of trust and so on. So we, we need to talk a little bit about the obstacles. Before I do, can I just throw some facts into, into, the, into the discussion here, which is, and these are all drawn from the uh, Open Banking Implementation Entity, where, where I went and had a look. They've got 330, 330 regulated providers, of which 200 are providers of accounts, so banks. You've got 123 regulated entities with one, at least one proposition. Not very many. You've got 4 million users. That's across consumers and across small businesses. The figure that worried me most, though, is like 8% of digitally enabled customers use at least one open banking app regularly, uh, mostly for, for payments. Um, there are some successes here, you know, like Moneybox and like Layer and so on, but they're relatively few in in number um we don't really have a fix on on the the size of the client base for for small businesses in this but you will see these apps are also as i've just indicated aimed at a relatively narrow range of of activities it's account switching it's account aggregation a bit of financial advice a bit of accounting a bit of credit scoring uh, but mainly um payments payment initiation uh, there's charitable giving as well and, and and so on but if you look at this I mean, how how far are we? I was about to say how close are we, but I'm really thinking how far away are we from a really vibrant open banking market in the UK, by which I mean one in which consumers have instant access to broad, what Catherine was mentioning there, broad ranges of, uh, of comparable bank um, without having to give their consent in some laborious way every time they, they go into the marketplace. I mean, and, and indeed having a full universe of providers as well both fintechs and banks fully engaged and how far away are we from that um harriet you mentioned frustration tell us how far away we are how frustrated are you well i was going to say i think you've already get, let the cat out of the bag really in, in saying that there's only four million users of open banking now you know I, i'm from starling we've got several million customers so of some of the other fintech banks in the space i mean that's less than what that's less than the number that the fintech banks have convinced to switch without the use of these open banking products so so it really goes to show that for whatever reason open banking in its current state is not providing enough innovation to really convince people to switch over um, and use these services um and and i i think there's 
a lot of the groundwork has been done, as I say, and this, this is really the very crux of our frustration. The groundwork is there. We can now share the data, but what are we going to do with it and how are we actually going to make it useful to customers? And I think that's the, that's the point at which we'll get customers in droves to come and try out these new services. But, but just, just giving access so that they can view their data in a different app, it's just not cutting it for customers today. And that's why we're only seeing that, that number at 4 million. I wonder if you'll see it more when people make that first change. So I've never swapped banks ever. The bank I had when I was little is the bank I have now. So when it becomes a change that's possible um, and you do it and then you see the benefit, perhaps you'll do it again more quickly. So I think maybe you'll, it, we're going up a curve really. Um, yeah, I think, but, but what I suspect is actually that that four million there is actually a subset of people who are already using a fintech bank, actually. So it's yeah, people who are great. already quite digitally minded, quite quite ahead of the curve, and then are aware of this and think, oh, I'll give that a go. And, and I don't think that's necessarily the direction we want this to go. I think what we'd like it to be is that it, it really gives everyone, no matter who you bank with, the opportunity to access something better. Um, and as Sarah says, perhaps even without knowing, you know, what's going on in the background, but knowing that you're giving consent for something better that, that, that you'll have access to. OK, look, we're, we're, we've hit upon one obstacle here, which is actually the consumer isn't making use of this as actively as, as they should. So we, we can sort of, the consumer is one obstacle. What other obstacles are there? I mean, the open banking implementation entity is funded by these big nine banks. Are those big nine banks afraid? of starting to share customer data. They're obviously in the dominant position. Catherine has just said she's been using them since she was a little girl. I'm probably the same. So they've got this captive client base. They're pretty, you know, understandably not wanting to let go of it. But are there other obstacles? Are people frightened that Amazon or Facebook will enter this space and start to, to clean up? Um, do these banks simply lack the technical skills to make this process work? Are they trapped in legacy systems? What are the other obstacles that you see in the marketplace, Sarah, perhaps you have a, a helicopter view of, of what's going on and what some of these obstacles that are causing this frustration actually are. I, look, I, I think um, having had the experience over, over time of working with some of the established uh, organisations, there is a sympathy there for them because they have systems that have been built over years and actually making a change is quite difficult. So with the new entrants, um, we, you know, we do have uh, and, and two great new entrants on this call who, who are able to make those changes a lot faster um, than the incumbents. So that is one, that is one thing. Um, but they have to, you know, in order to keep up, they have to change. I mean, we're seeing from an open banking perspective, current account switching um, and current account switching to, to the points that I think have been made and, and Starling and Monzo and Revolut and Wise are all benefiting from that. That because they have automated these processes, whereas they know when that when that actual and, and, and Catherine, you should really try changing banks because if you if you come onto one of these new platforms, you, it'll be minutes, absolutely minutes, and they'll do everything else for you, and it's totally verified. But what you will know or what you will find out is that in the established organisations, they've got three or four floors of people manually doing that. I would. I know from Starling's perspective, I would suggest from Chetwoods and some of the others, they don't. So, you know, there is where, where some of the time delay is. And, and the, we, we need to make it easy for, for consumers. But I have to say, I'm not a supporter of completely frictionless. I, I think we need to have an element of friction. So, you know, we've seen, and we're not going to come on to buy now, pay later, but where that is made very easy, that's getting lots of people into lots of trouble. So, I think there is an element that needs just a little bit of friction here, just to remind people and to put the consumer in the controlling position of where their data is and what's happening with their data so that, so that it's easy for them. Now, Julia, as Sarah said, uh, you've had the benefit of not um, having to deal with legacy systems. You've been able to build this thing um, from, from the outset. Do you think that one of the things that is slowing down adoption within the financial institutions themselves is the sheer cost of implementing this. If, as Sarah said, you're, you're lumbered with legacy systems, yeah. you may not have the skills to write an API. <laughs> um, you know, you've got to clean it, your data's all over the map. It can actually be quite complex to get involved, can it not, if you're a 200 year old bank? Yeah, absolutely. And I spent 10 years in a, in a big high street bank right before I did some time in consulting and then and then Chetwood. So um, so I know, I know how hard that is as well as Sarah said. 
Um, and I think, yeah, absolutely, it's it's slowing them down. I guess the question, back to Harriet's point on making it useful for consumers, is who who is going to create the use case for consumers to really sign up to open banking? And we've seen that if consumers want access to credit, that is a strong use case where customers will be prepared to share their data in order to get access to credit. That's one use case. The use case of account aggregated data, as Harriet said, isn't isn't bringing droves of customers through and maybe that's because there's no need for it or maybe it's because nobody is really doing it in a way that that really does add value um but i guess the question for me is is it the big big, big banks that are going to go and do that or is it the fintechs that are going to create those propositions because really it for me it always comes back to this is just technology unless there is a reason for customers to do it um, and I think we can all see there's lots of opportunity here, but somebody needs to create that compelling proposition that really, really gets customers happy to sign up and, and share data. Um, and I don't think we've got that really yet. And I think that's why we're seeing such low numbers of take up. Um, yes, there are other issues. We've said trust, communication, you know, how we've positioned open banking, um, some of those concerns around data sharing, as we've said, they're all important. But But the key really is that we haven't found the the kind of the crux of something that's exciting and uh, significant enough really for people to to bother and, and to try it. Do you know what that killer app is going to be, Julia? Do you have a clear idea in your own mind? Or <laughs> I wish. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, there are, it's interesting when you research with customers, it, you definitely can position it in a way that consumers are willing to share. Um, and so I think there are lots of ideas out there around particularly as you know as people talked about many years ago I guess switching and moving consumers to better products better rates uh, whether that's savings accounts that at the end of a fixed period you know reducing rate and actually doing some of those automated transfers of money I think you know there is definitely a role for us because we are a multi-brand business we're not trying to create a current account base um and so it doesn't, it isn't a natural proposition for us to think about in terms of how you would essentially link all those products up because we don't have customers coming and using that kind of current account service. But I think that's probably where it will get to is that you'll end up in a space where you don't need to go on a results page and search for the best offers because you're using an app that's already told you that your savings rate is suboptimal and that you should be on a better insurance product and potentially a better broadband supplier um, or energy provider at the same time. And actually that you've got something that sits in the middle of all of that that is, you know, is really automating and taking all of the effort out of that process for you. I guess that's where I, I think it should get to. Now, we're starting to get some questions and comments coming in from the audience, but um, but before we turn to those, I'd just like to ask Catherine, um, is it, how hard is it to write an API? I bet you've written APIs, which is more than I've ever done. Can they just sort of, I don't know, go to Swagger Hub and, or, or some other portal and, and download the code they need? What's the problem here? It's not, is, it, is it writing an API or is it just cleaning up the data sets which feed the API? So, so writing an API can be very basic to very complex, and it depends. I mean, an API is essentially an interface between two technologies, and it allows them to exchange data. So it could be something very, very basic, and we'll start with basic APIs in class, and then they'll get more complex, but nowhere near as complex as the APIs we're, we're talking about here. Um, uh, getting really, really good documentation around them, really high-quality development, and a community, good examples for the developers who are going to go off and build the apps to understand. These are really important sort of aspects of it. Um, legacy systems is a big deal, I'd say, to the to the banks. And this is probably a major thing that's slowing them down in terms of how quick they can expose their data. Um, I mean, you could, some banking systems will be running on COBOL, of which you probably won't be able to get developers easily, you know. Um, it's a big, it's a big issue. <laughs> right. So legacy systems are a problem more than more than writing an API. Now, I'd like to read this comment from um, from Michelle Cracknell, who says, "I thought Money Savings Expert is owned by MoneySupermarket.com, which is wholly funded by providers. There is a perception that Martin Lewis is not paid, but he is. I do agree. He's done a great job in getting some people to believe that they can make better financial decisions. Um, so, a comment about that. Um, we did bring up." Um, Martin Lewis. Her question is, um, is trust in banks sufficient for the customer to adopt open banking? Banks have a history of mis-selling. The ease of switching banks to the customer is achieved by government legislation and not by 
the banks. In other words, one of the obstacles for consumers here is if the bank comes along and says, let's do some open banking, they think I'm not going to do it with you, um, even if the government has given us the right to, to do that. Um, Harriet, do you, by the long history of, of banks not being trusted as the service providers, if not as people who keep your money safe, yeah, um, it's interesting because I think you, you could see it both ways. I think, yes, uh, trust in banks might be a barrier, but actually, if you don't trust banks, then you might want your data to be somewhat more democratized and therefore have other people with access to it who can make decisions so that you can compare the decisions the one's making versus the other. So, yeah. so it could actually really help with, 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 with trust in, in the banking space as a whole. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the spirit of open banking at its heart and and i i really hope that it does hope to get to achieve this one day is really that there's just full transparency um you know for, for, for people in terms of their data and the data from other providers i feel that that at its heart will allow customers to, re to reach a place of trust but there are these barriers to get over to get there there's a, a comment here from sebastian graver who says um, open banking seems to be an intermediary tool for a redefined financial services landscape, which has yet to emerge from the supply side, by which it means basically banks, or the demand side, that's consumers and, and, and small businesses. The supply side has very limited benefits to gain from opening their data vaults, the point I was alluding to earlier, that banks may be reluctant to share customer data. And on the demand side, it's fairly well served, he says, in matters that may be more complicated uh, than meet the eye. In other words, consumers, companies may have complicated relationships with their banks. They can't just sort of switch because they're able to in this relatively narrow range of, of products which are offered at the moment. He also says regulators are blowing hot and cold on the topic, it seems, depending on the regulatory area being scrutinized. Open banking needs its killer use cases, the point you made, uh, Julia. He, he, he agrees with you about that. Um, without doing away with the belt and braces provided by the incumbents. In other words, these banks, we may not like they do provide resilience, safety, capital, reliability, and so on, the trust point. So ease of use and, and lack of concern. So I think um, Sebastian is, is really kind of agreeing with, with what we've said, which is reassuring that, uh, that we're not uh, talking to ourselves, but his experience matches the same. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on, on that. Uh, I'm kind of intrigued by this idea that the incumbent banks are, are a problem for a good reason as well as a bad reason. and maybe the regulation needs to push them a bit harder. So maybe an area I was just going to come on to was, was back to the, the killer use case, um, because I think this is this is the thing that we're all looking for. Um, we've talked a bit about credit in the consumer space, but I think we should also talk a little bit about the SME space, um, because actually I, I think there are lots of opportunities there. Um, SMEs today are still even though there's more opportunity in the market, they're still underserved in many ways. And actually they still work with so many different siloed systems in, in, the, you know, in the office, they're having to go from the bank to the payroll system, to the pension system, to this, that, and the other. And actually they are all systems, they're all IT systems. And, and today we have the technology, Catherine's been talking about it, to connect the dots there. So actually maybe the killer use case isn't in the consumer space, maybe it's in the SME space. And that's how everyone starts to really see how this can make a difference. That perhaps leads the way and, and then the consumer use cases follow. So I wouldn't be surprised if the killer use case start, starts on the SME side. Mm -hmm. Now, um... What about, on this killer app point, uh, what about moving towards open finance? Harriet's just brought up the question of insurance and pensions, for example. What about trying to move this in that search into other areas? Credit is the, is the obvious one, and we, we've mentioned that. But maybe we can start to move into, um, in, into, the, into the retirement provision area. There is this discussion going on about creating a pensions dashboard, for example. I mean, pensions are mind-bogglingly complex for the average consumer to, to understand. I, I hear what you say, Harriet, about fo focusing on companies, but but maybe we just need this. This needs to be broadened beyond open banking to cover a greater range of products, and then the killer app will come to the surface more easily. Julia, you're nodding. Um, does that, that mean you have a thought on, on whether I'm right or not? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I think, as I said, I think ultimately with open finance, you would want to, you know, you would want to get to a place where it's it's broader even perhaps than finances, you know, perhaps it's broader than in terms of things like energy bills and broadband bills and, and other payments that we can obviously see from a transactional perspective going out of accounts. Um, so it's actually quite easy once you have that data to be able to understand if people are being under or overcharged. Um, and so, yeah, I totally agree. I think I think that that is where, for me, it becomes potentially more useful. Um, and I, I say potentially because I think it, you know, it does come back down then to how easy is it for consumers to sign up and and use these products. You know, how how much work are we expecting the consumer to do up front to make this this app work? How much do they have to do? Um, and as always, that needs to be as as simple as possible um, to get maximum benefit. But I think yes, certainly broadening it out from credit and moving it into that that broader range of pensions, insurance, and then beyond that, um, other other payment services effectively. Um, that's where I think it starts to get really interesting. And I do agree with Harriet's point on SME. And I think, you know, certainly through COVID, that's one of the things that, that I've read about. We, we don't look after SME, but it is something that people are talking about, that there has been more adoption from SME businesses on the back of general digital adoption through, through the pandemic. Um, and I think, I think you're right, Harriet, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there because clearly there are, there are plenty of needs not being served. So I think the answer for me probably isn't in one place. There's probably lots of places that, that something could be created that's compelling enough to get consumers or SMEs to use. Um, I just don't know whether we've seen it yet. I don't think it's out there yet. I don't think we, any of us can look at something and say they've got it, their best place to deliver that. Um, it, it feels like that's still waiting to be delivered against. What about what about personalizing it, coming up with actual products for that individual consumer or indeed that individual business, that package of things that's just right? This is a kind of is yeah. that an impossible dream or I mean, your business is driving in that direction. Yeah, no, I, I don't think it is. And, you know, I spent a little bit of time in kind of the wealth management and private banking space um, a few years before I joined here. And I think, you know, they're also talking about ultimately how do you start to automate that that kind of relationship based model which is you know in part directing customers to to make better decisions with their money and and this is almost an, a, a broader better extension of that for me which is actually how could you do that across someone's entire financial commitments um, you know I think we all we all know that the high street banks went through a, a big push probably 15 years ago or so about talking about doing kind of annual reviews and it was used absolutely to bring customers in to discuss their financial position um, but clearly was done in a very biased brand you know from a biased brand perspective because they were clearly looking to to sell products within their own company if you can imagine something that is digital that is doing that in an automated fashion and is scouring the whole market for the best deals and that's where I think it probably won't be a bank whether it's a fintech or a high street bank, it probably won't be a bank that can best win in this space. Ultimately, it will be someone that is more independent than that and so has that greater level of trust and is genuinely encouraging customers to switch products more. Now, a lot of the banks won't like that, clearly, for the reasons we've outlined. Um, and you know, personally, from a check with perspective, we're quite comfortable with it because we think it's our job to make sure we've got the best product for those consumers at that point in time. So bring it on, I guess. Um, but that's, yeah, that's where we'd like to get to. Mm -hmm. just, just coming in on that, Julia, for a minute, I think, you know, when we when we talk about banks, I think we need to be really clear, we've got new entrants, and we've got established yeah. entrants, and actually, some of the, the new entrants will say bring it on, um, yeah. because they will, they will want that transparency, you know, they've been they've spent a lot of time building the trust with their consumer um, and many of them were coming to market with the we're not going to cross sell upsell or miss sell um, yeah. so I think they're possibly in a in a place where they might like yourselves say look you know what bring it on we're ready for it um, we want to be challenged by our consumers it's our consumers who are going to keep us true to providing the best the best products and and you know, it, it, as said, if the established organisations are unable to keep up with that pace, I mean, that's where the challenge is. I think they've really got to um, be driving things from, from that side as well. They do have a large establishment of, uh, of consumers, although saying that, Dominic, I mean, the, the, the numbers that you quoted at the beginning, um, I'm not sure how much they 
reflect the the adoption curve absolutely taking off through the pandemic because I think the switching numbers massively increased. The amount of people who downloaded mobile banking apps and switched to new yeah. providers um, was significant. So I'm not sure what the date is on those open banking um, figures, but uh, but I would I would suggest that they're possibly um, larger than that. But you know, there is an it was, it was data from last month, so it's not out of date. Um, but um, interesting thought. I, I'd like to ask a question now about about regulation whether the regulators need to to get um need to rethink how they're doing this i was surprised when i looked at what's going on in open everything um there were like 12 entities involved in what you might call open data open finance more more broadly conceived so the government itself doesn't seem particularly joined up in this respect we've got these initiatives going on in in energy um this is my data initiative to make retail consumers able to switch their energy provider more easily at the moment, you can do that. You've been able to do that for a while, but it takes like three weeks to happen and the data is all manual and all the rest of it. Uh, similarly with, with Ofcom and uh, has got an initiative going on open communication so you can switch your broadband provider more easily. So if we place open banking, open finance in the context of, of this these other initiatives, is there something which the, the government should actually be doing? In other words, in Australia, for example, they have this consumer a uh, data right act and a very clear explicit program to start working through industries with a long-term goal of giving consumers control of their data and using that to buy products and services is that something which you think would be helpful to your open banking business in the united kingdom harriet more legislative push if you like regulatory push yeah, I, I do think so. Um, and, I, and I think the reason that, that that would be helpful is because it would take the onus off just the banks, you know, that they seem to be in this world where, oh, it's open banking, the banks are going to solve it all over there, because they've got loads of data about transactions, but actually transaction data on its own, siloed away from everything else isn't very useful. Actually, it's linking it with everything else is where we can where we can do the really clever stuff. So I think I think it encourages the rest of all of the industries to get get on board and actually you know the apis that we're talking about they already exist in all of these other industries they're all using technology every day that that use apis so it doesn't need to be something alien that only, that only financial services are using Catherine's smiling because she knows it's all around us today um you know sarah talked about you know the smartphone analogy earlier and the apps on our phone you know we do so much on apps on our phone nowadays. We expect, in fact, pretty much everything we do to have an app on our phone. So it, it would really take the onus off just the financial services sector and encourage everyone else to get on board. And it's only when everyone's on board that we're going to see big change here. Now, one thing the government is doing is uh, is encouraging digital identities. It's not doing much more than encouraging it, but I think the FCA has made absolutely clear uh, that digital identities are crucial to making open finance uh, work. It's inviting vendors of, of digital identity products to, to come and play in its in its regulatory sandbox. The government some time ago altered its its money laundering uh, rules to make it easier to use electronic forms of of identification. So, if we imagine a world in which um, those digital identities are created out of consented data of the type we've been talking about, makes it much easier to onboard clients eventually makes it much easier for people to buy and sell and come and go um, in the marketplace that it's talking about here, where it covers not just financial products, but lots of other things as well. Banking data on its own isn't much, isn't much, um, isn't much use. We have a government framework, in fact, trust framework for creating these digital identities. And it's frustrating again, that, that this doesn't seem to be getting much traction. There seems to be quite a lot of cynicism uh, in the financial services industry about the value of digital identities. So perhaps Catherine, you could give us a, a technological perspective, if you like, on, on the value of, of, of digital identities and the complexity of obtaining and maintaining, updating the, the personal data. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, from a technical perspective, um, I think it could be useful to have a digital identity for, for especially now we're looking at moving towards um, lots of what we do in a virtual space so i think a digital identity would be would be good in that sense um but again you know what happens when you when you're eight do you get one when you're 18 do you get one when you're younger than 18 there's lots of ethical questions around it as well but 
do we really want a digital identity for everything we do online? Just looking at Facebook with the metaverse the other day, do we want to always be identified in everything we do? Do we want all our finances to be? I don't know. There's ethical questions around whether it's um, a good idea, but I can see from a technical perspective, it would make things quicker um, uh, to be able to move around banks, to use different apps and things, but ethically. Well, I think I'd rather control, own and control my data myself than have uh, Facebook or, or Microsoft or Google or whoever or Amazon controlling it. Um, Julia, would, are you a fan of digital identities? Yeah, I think, you know, it would, I think I agree with Catherine's points about consumer. And I think you would find that not many people are as well as informed as you, Dominic. I would not necessarily look at it quite as positively as you have mm -hmm. um, in terms of how that data is shared. But I think um, putting that to one side, I think as a business, it would, you know, it would massively help because actually, you know, part of our challenge is about identifying customers digitally. Um, as Sarah said earlier, you know, we don't have tons of people doing manual work. We made a decision right at the beginning of setting up the business that we wanted to be as automated and digital as possible. And that allows us to offer those best rates, whether that's on our lending products or on our savings products. Um, and so having a way to do that that is reliable and common across the industry would be excellent. You know, we all pay different providers for different services that have different levels of coverage to try and do that. And ultimately, many of the banks and fintechs end up doing the dropouts of those journeys manually um, or not at all. Um, and customers, as a result, you know, have either a more clunky version um, of the onboarding journey or none at all. Um, and in many cases, they just have less, less access to financial services products if, if their data is less easily identifiable. Um, so yeah, I think there's loads of great cus customer benefit from it. And I think there's loads of business benefit too. Um, I guess it's just back down to that point of how would people feel about it and how do we make sure that you give consumers the control um, you know, I liked Sarah's point earlier about not totally frictionless. So you've got to create a way that consumers feel that they either understand and trust it or to some extent have some control over it. Um, I think there are some really important pieces there around to how it would, uh, you know, how successful it would be, would be ultimately reliant on getting those factors right. Sarah. I think digital ID is something you and I, Dominic, have had, had many deep conversations about. And I, I think it's inevitable, right? It's going to come. Um, it's, it's how we do that and how we take people on the journey and how we build the trust. Um, because, you know, when we look at uh, the, the broad sense of consumers and they see data breaches and they worry and, you know, we, when we'd all, we, we'd all do, we, we'd all feel the same way. Um, so I think it's a, it's a slow process step by step it's a transparent process I, i'll reiterate again i think it is a process that needs the consumer to be involved in that to have some elements of friction to recheck but to do that in a way that is using language that they really understand and not over complicating it and not putting lots of t's and c's that none of us read and click okay um, you know we've got to come come to a an understanding that people are in a in a fast moving world, we've got to sympathize with that. We've got to improve the, the user journey, the user communications um, and demystify some of the rules and regulations if we're gonna get people to generally on board with these things. And, and back to the point, you know, we've all said we haven't, haven't yet found the killer app, but one of the things I've just been sitting here thinking is I run a business and I have a, 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 um, my own personal banking. And actually I, I, I'm, I'm I'm agreeing that SMEs might be driving this because, you know, small businesses have l very little resource to get on, um, get online, to automate their accounts, to automate their, um, their tax, to making their tax digital. We you know we love all of these things that the government is, is trying to put out there, um, automating the expense process, automating the pension contributions and the payroll. You know, these are all things that I juggle with normally on a Sunday afternoon. Um, so being able to do that in a very trustworthy, easy way, and, and obviously I've selected many of the products that are out there in the fintech space um, to help me with that. So may maybe that is absolutely right. This, this drive could come from, from SMEs and, and, you know, let's be really um, understanding it's the SMEs that drive the economy in the UK. You know, these are the lifeblood of our economy um, and they're the, the organizations that have adapted uh, and had to adapt really quickly through the pandemic. So I think we'll see 
we'll see a lot more of that um, adoption. Um, you know, many of you on, on this this call will know that uh, I'm I'm married to a farming family, and even the farm has um, gone over to uh, digital accounts in the pandemic. Um, so if we can start doing things like that from the tractor, um, then you know I think there is a chance. But but it, I, I do think it's these small businesses that have really had to um, adapt over the last uh, couple of years. And if we, I, I'm, I'm always an optimist, so let's see the positives from the pandemic. And I think, you know, the adoption of digital um, uh, for, the, for the benefit and the improvement and in increasing productivity of the UK economy could be a real positive out of this if we uh, build on it. Well, that's a very strong point you've made, Sarah. And I'm interested, to know what, uh, interested in what Harriet has to say about this, because I remember Andy Holday when he was at the Bank of England making a speech. The question was, what's, where does Britain's productivity problem come from? I think the speech was called All Hub and, and No Spoke, something like that. And his main point was that actually Britain has this selection of quite large companies at the centre who are very digital, or as digital as we could expect, and using technology to raise productivity. And you've got this very long tail of small companies who are totally non-digital. So actually, if, if open finance, open data starts to drive those smaller companies into uh, adopting digital technology more aggressively will actually have huge productivity effects. I mean, it's a huge win mm. for the country, not just for um, Starling Bank or Chetwood. It's for all of us, right, Harry? Yeah, absolutely. I, I probably disagree with you slightly there, though. I, I think that it was disagree with Andy Holday, not with me, remember? Uh, uh, with Andy. <laughs> I, I don't think it's open banking that's been encouraged them to consider digital options. I think, as Sarah said, it, it was actually the COVID pandemic because mm -hmm. they just had no other option at this time. And obviously being a digital banking provider, that was that was good for Starling because it was an opportunity for us to, to, to offer those services to, to those SMEs who perhaps would never have made that leap or would have taken longer to make the leap. Um, so it was a very good thing for us. I, I hope those customers would say it was a good thing for them because they're enjoying their experience now. But I think, you know, as Sarah said, really the pandemic did you know, speed up this this whole digitalization process for SMEs. And now I hope some of those SMEs will consider open banking uh, propositions and maybe some more will be developed to help some of those day to day problems that Sarah was was talking about. Mm -hmm. but, but Harriet, to your point, I don't think they need to consider open banking. I think they just need to consider an ease of doing business. Um, yeah. And this is where uh, that, you know, we, we, we in our world talk about open banking. Um, we in our world talk about APIs and all the rest of it. Majority of people running a business don't want to use that language. And I don't think they need to use that language. They just need to know that they're dealing with an organization. As you quite rightly said, you know, um, Starling reacted um, very, very quickly to uh, providing the B bills, the C bills, and the support to those SME businesses when it was when it was needed, and and I think just understanding those SMEs and taking things um, to them, and and just putting yourself in their shoes, uh, and and bringing products to the market that will help them increase that productivity. I mean, look, you know, I'm, I'm terribly proud. We've got two heavily um, Welsh businesses here that are helping SMEs and consumers. And, you know, I was talking to, a, to another um, uh, Welsh fintech the other day that is actually working with the, with the farming community, showing them how to build business cases to make them green, to have green, um, uh, green energy solutions. And just, you know, some of the, it, it, I think there's the, the, there's, there's the top down, but actually if we come bottom up, um, and we realize that we can get a huge amount of productivity from this large, um, large, very, um, very sort of rich SME businesses that we have in the UK. I mean, we're, you know, we're really um, entrepreneurial, innovative country um, and people. Um, and if we can provide more to support those, I, I, yeah, I think we, we will increase the productivity, hub or spoke or whatever it is, but let's focus on... Um, on, on bringing everybody, um, as they say, you know, sort of a rising boat helps many float or whatever the phrase is. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, let, let, let's, let's hope more, you know, let's help more rise. Yeah. Can I throw um, just another thought that came in as you were talking as well into it? So the other thing that, because we offer banking as a service at Chetwood, and I guess the other consideration for me is that I think a lot of non-financial services companies could benefit here too. So we're dealing with a lot of partnerships who are ultimately looking to help their consumer bases to build 
you know, build their consumer base in terms of loyalty and trust by being able to offer their groups of customers financial services products. Now, they don't have the data clearly that the, that the banks have because they've not been in that part of the market. But open banking is, you know, if we can fix it from a consumer perspective, some of those businesses could be the ones actually to come up with that killer app or that killer proposition because they're, they're already serving a group of customers. They already have had a base of customers um, who they've built up over many years in, in, in many cases. Um, and they're already meeting a, a series of needs for them. This is about strengthening and adding to that. And actually open banking could be a really important enabler. So, yeah, you got, you got me thinking with the kind of the farming analogy, I guess, in terms of just thinking more broadly outside financial services. There are many other businesses as well that could actually probably, um, you know, really be starting to think about what their version of this could look like. And and just just to that point, I think you know th- this this conversation started um, by the promotion and um, you know sort of discussion around partnerships. I think the important thing in this, and and I, I think you know what we're seeing is we're seeing a changing shift: partnerships, collaboration, ecosystems, yeah. um, working together to solve problems. Um, many people on this call, we won't know what the problems are unless we go out and talk to the consumers, whether they're SMEs or whether they're um, individuals. Yeah. So I, I think there is there is an element of of going out and hearing what the problems are on the ground uh, rather than um, sitting, you know, sort of in lab somewhere thinking we can be innovative, um, you know, to, to, to actually solving those problems. So, yeah, I, it's exciting. We're, we're, we're into our last five minutes now. Um, I can assure you, Sarah, my Massey Ferguson tractor is resolutely non-digital, but I'd like to I'd like to 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 drag us back to to end um, for the people listening on a note about how we take this whole thing forward. We've talked a lot about how frustrating it is and how slow adoption is, and yet how massive the potential this is. Not not just to to transform um, the finances of of most consumers to to include more consumers to actually possibly even fix the the nation's productivity problems. And it's not just us who are thinking like this. The, the FCA has, and I, I'll quote them here, they say open finance is based on the principle that financial services customers own and control both the data they supply and the data which is created on their behalf. And they've written that into their open finance principles. So they're imagining this marketplace in which consumers control their data that reverses the mis-selling, which Michelle Cracknell referred to as plagued traditional finance for years, is going to force suppliers like Chetwood and like Starling and like lots of other organizations to actually change their products to what consumers want, puts the consumer in the in the driving seat. Eventually it, it gets personalized. And so at the moment, we've got this world with these big fangs over there who are owning and controlling data, destroyed trust, which Catherine referred to, one of the problems with, with young people. So if we think about how do we make this happen, do we need an education program or will that killer app be enough? Do banks need to work with energy companies and telecoms companies? What's the way to make this happen? I'd like a thought from each of you on that. And I'm open to all ideas, but Harriet, perhaps we could start with you. What's your solution about the open data revolution that we all think will be so positive? Yeah, and actually, it's a nice round off for me because I started saying we were a bit frustrated. And, you know, it's good to really question why. For us, it's because perhaps we've all had our head in the sand a little bit about just continuing on with the movement and not really recognizing that the first stage of the movement is kind of done. People can share data. And the next thing is, what are we going to do with it? So I, so I think actually it's a case of getting some of these groups that we've been talking about in the room, n- not just the banks over here, not just the fintechs over there, get them all in a room and actually start to say, what can we do if we put this data with that data? What can we do if we add this in the mix? What can we do if we do that? Whether it's SME, whether it's consumer, it's about bringing everyone on board. And I think we just need to have that acknowledgement, that conversation, and then we can work out what the next actions are. Julia, what's your thought about how we make it happen? Yeah, and I think, well, to Harriet's point and to Sarah's point earlier, I think it's absolutely about us working together on it. But then I think it's about getting back down to that. What problem are we solving for the customers? And when I say customers, I mean both retail consumers and SME. But for us, you know, doing that primary customer research, staying really close to what is the problem? What is the need we're trying to solve for? And then, as Harriet said, thinking about how as a 
ecosystem of lots of people, we can start to connect the dots to solve those real problems. That's the key for me. And whether that is a killer app or whether it's something much more simple, um, I don't know. But I think there's uh, finding the really strong use cases from a consumer perspective is the thing that will really get traction. Catherine, you're, you're, you're teaching young people in particular. What's your solution to getting a more positive public perception of open banking plus open finance plus open data and what it can do for them as consumers, for them as citizens, and indeed for the economy in which they live and work in? Well, it's an interesting one, um, and I'm not, I'm not sure what the answer is. I mean, I, it, it, it does come down to UX and, and user experience and... Not education, Catherine. You don't think oh, education I'm, I'm is a part there, I'm getting there. Um, uh, yeah, you know, in terms of Cardiff University, if you want to build these apps, then Software Academy to help you build the APIs, we've got the Data Science Academy, and really we need the businesses, we need you guys to feed in projects so our students can learn within that sector. We want to be a fintech hub, and, and Cardiff and Wales is very well placed for fintech, mm -hmm. so yeah. Uh, but in terms of what will get my students on board, I'm not really sure, but I'll do some more investigating for you. Oh, okay, build businesses. I'm sure that's music to your ears, Sarah. Perhaps a last comment from you, because we must stop in a couple of minutes. How yeah. do we make open the open data digital economy happen? I think we, we've all said it several times. I think it's collaboration and ecosystems, and that's what FinTech Wales is here to do. We work with Cardiff University, we work with Chetwood, we work with Starling, we work with a multitude of others. Um, we, we listen to consumers, whether they are retail or they're SMEs. We look at those problem statements, and I'm delighted to say we're just about to open uh, season two of our foundry, um, accelerating and fixing those problems. So uh, it's really important that um, we are at the hub of these things to bring to together academia businesses and the regulators and the governments which we do to solve these problems and i'm delighted to say that actually in wales i think we're really um, ahead of the game we are establishing ourselves as a, a globally recognized fintech hub of excellence uh, and i'm proud to say that we're achieving that so um, yeah, look, look out for what we're doing on the on the next season of the Foundry, because I'm expecting all of these people to be involved, the students, the businesses, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the innovative um, financial providers, um, as well as the larger organisations who want to learn. We've all got to do it together. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. We've run over by a few minutes. We started a bit late, so um, I won't apologise for that, but I think we should stop there. Uh, I'd like to thank our panellists, uh, Julia McColl from Chet, Dr. Catherine Jones from Cardiff University, Harriet Rees from Starling Bank, and of course, Sarah Williams-Gardner from Fintech Wales. Thank you also to you, our audience, for your questions and your comments. Uh, at Future of Finance, our next webinar is uh, Tuesday the 14th. That's Tuesday next week at our usual time of two o'clock. In it, we're going to be discussing something we didn't have time to, to talk about today. It's why the law is such a compelling use case for AI and what law firms are doing about it. And AI is something which could easily have become part of this discussion. I hope lots of you will join us then. But for now, it's goodbye from the five of us. Goodbye. <laughs>